Okay, morning everyone. How are you going? I know people were saying it was cold in here yesterday. Is it any warmer today or is it? Is it warmer or not? Okay, for now. <laughs> so no one's too cold at the moment? It's good at the moment? Okay, all right. Okay, let's get going. So, um, we're going to do a quiz first, so let's do that. Um, I'm still tracking down some, some of those little devices, but hopefully I'm going, to, I'm going to try the library next to see if I can get some. Okay, we'll just wait. Oh, how come that's not display? That's annoying. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, that's not very helpful. <laughs> Hang on a moment. Okay, that's not very helpful, is it? I presume people use this screen. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, screens, okay. Okay, let's get going. So, someone's, someone's coming to fix this, so we'll just proceed without it for now. Um, and hopefully, within the next few minutes, someone will come and fix it. So let's have a, 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 quick, um, a quick quiz. See how you, you know, so you just have to look for now, you just have to look at some of these screens here. Um, so, these are questions for, for, um, based on the stuff we talked about yesterday. Again, if you don't have one of those clickers, sorry, you just have to do a virtual, uh, virtual answer. Um, 
So which one of the following is not a relevant concept of resolution for remote sensing? Temporal, spectral, temperature, or spatial? So remember we talked about different aspects of resolution. <coughs> Almost 100% right. Excellent. Yes, temperature. So remember, when you're thinking about remote sensing data, uh, there's the, I guess there's this, when you're using remote sensing data, it's important to understand what the um, temporal, spectral, and spatial resolution are, because that determines essentially what you can do with that data to some extent. Okay. And the higher the resolution, the more information. But generally, these things trade off against each other. So you, it's often, often. It's almost impossible because of just technological constraints, uh, size of, of data sets and so on, to have high temporal, spectral, and spatial resolution. It, that tends not to happen. Um, but I guess over time, technology is allowing us to, to um, increase both temporal, spectral, and spatial resolution. So, okay. You're going to fix the... Um, yeah, it's that one that's not working. So I just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay. Remember we talked about the modifiable aerial unit problem or MALP. So it refer which what does it refer to? The problem of getting accurate locations. A. Spatial relationships depend on the resolution at which we measure spatial data. That's answer B. Or C. Things close together are more similar than things far apart. Or D, the issue that the classification of satellite images can never be 100% accurate. So what is it? Oh, you want to fix that? Yeah. Okay. So you have to remember those answers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> have a complete guess. All right, we'll just wait a couple minutes while I sort this out. Okay, thank you. We're all set. Okay, so, all right, let's see what, how, how you answered. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so this is the, this idea that actually the scale at which you, the resolution at which you measure things determines the relationships between things. Remember I gave you the example of, of uh, wheat yields and potato yields, where the relationships in the UK are quite different depending on whether you measure them at um, county levels or, or, or broader or finer resolutions. Um, so, so the others are, well, the others are, um, and this is just an, a positional accuracy issue. Um, this is the um, Tobler's first law of geography, and really this is a, um, an attribute error issue. Okay. Make sense? Okay, this is an easy one. What is the minimum number of satellites required to determine your location accurately using a GPS, including elevation? Yep. So, so yeah, four, four satellites. You need four. In theory, in theory, if your um, clocks were all perfectly synchronized, you could, have, you could get your location with three. But because the clock on your GPS device isn't synchronized with the satellite clocks, you need that fourth satellite to do, essentially do that synchronization of the clocks. Okay? So that's why you need that fourth. OK, okay? make sense? 
So which one of the following is an important reason to include metadata with geographic, geographic spelt wrong, with geographic data? It is critical information to aid the sharing of data. It makes data sets have greater positional accuracy. It is required by law or it is part of the vector data model. So why do we need metadata? I assume you all know what metadata is by now. So that's right. So it's it's so most of you've got that right as well. It's it's um, information to help sharing of data. So if you've created a data set, um, then uh, it allows you essentially to tell people what the data is about, where it came from, how accurate it is, and so on. Yep. Okay. So confusion or error matrix is one way to assess which one of the following. Attribute accuracy, positional accuracy, completeness, or logical consistency. What's that a, a way of characterizing error for? Which type of error? Given that no spatial data set is 100% accurate. Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. So, so there's, I guess, there's a little bit of perhaps confusion here. Um, so it's actually attribute accuracy. So, remember the example I gave you, which was a classified satellite image, where you're classifying a satellite image into different land cover types. Essentially, those land cover types are uh, attribute, um, or non-spatial uh, attributes. So it's the, it's basically what you're the testing is what are the attributes of the, the geographic features, so that's what they are. So uh, error matrices are basically designed specifically to examine error in attribute accuracy. Um, uh, positional accuracy is really uh, related to the difference between your true location and your actual recorded location. Um, and logical consistency is really these, these errors that, that break topological rules, so connections between roads or polygons not sharing boundaries, those types of things. So they're, they're things that, that are represented in your GIS data set that, that are, don't make logical sense in the real world. Okay. And no one answered completeness, so yeah, and completeness is just missing data. Yeah. Important to know, I think, whether your data sets you're using are complete or not. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So I think when you're thinking about errors in your data, there are these different types of errors, and actually the, the question yesterday with the practical was really about that. Thinking about the data you've, you, you've created by digitizing and then thinking, well, what are the types of errors um, that, that are inherent in that, that data you've created and, and how you deal with it? So that's really a question about this. Yeah. Um, is that all the questions? Yeah, so that's five. Okay, so okay with that? So it seems like most of you got, got most of the concepts from yesterday. So, I'll just so today we're going to talk about, we're going to have a lecture on, um, oh, first of all, a any questions about the field trip tomorrow? So do you know where you need to be? No? Yep. So to get the bus, do you want me to show you? I can show you on a map. <laughs> so actually we're going to meet by the pool, Blair Drive, but I'll show you, if I can bring up a UQ map, just so there's, there's only one pool, um, so just so there's no confusion, I put it in an email, but if there's any confusion, I'll just show you. Um, so we're here in 39A, this is the pool here, yep. Just, and then we're going to meet here on Blair Drive. Okay, I put the I put the location in the email I sent, so we'll be there. We'll leave at 7:30, so be there 10 minutes before. Um, okay, if you're late, we'll leave without you. So don't be late. Um, 
If there's an issue, I'll give you my mobile number. If there's an issue on the morning, give me a shout. Feel free to call me um, if there's any issue. If stuck in traffic or whatever. But there shouldn't be any traffic at that hour of the morning or public transport is late. Um, so we'll leave from there and we will, it's about a 20 minute drive to the site. So we'll be there about eight o'clock probably. And then we'll leave the site about one. Um, so we'll have you know, about five hours there or so. And then, so we should be back here by two at the latest, I imagine. So. Um, if we have to drive there, where do we go? Right, did you send me an email no, saying? I didn't. Right, so if someone's going to drive, anyone's going to drive there, important, work, important so. you send me an email. Okay. Because I'll, what I'll do, I'll just create a, this afternoon, I'll just create a list of people who want to drive and I'll send you some instructions. Yeah, so if you don't email me, you won't get the instructions. So do that, and then, I, then I've got a, a record of who wants to drive and who doesn't. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really need to drive, then that's fine. I'd sort of discourage it. I don't want everyone driving. It's a bit, yeah, it's difficult to, yeah, it's a difficult to arrange. Then. Um, so essentially, if you're driving, you'll, I'll, we'll, you'll have to meet the bus outside the entrance to the property, and then we'll drive in together. Um, the key things to bring, I guess, are, I don't know. I don't think tomorrow's going to be that hot, so it should be all right. I think the forecast was for 27 degrees or something, so it's not too bad. But bring um, hats and sunscreen. Um, one thing we're very particular about, and you have, you have to wear enclosed shoes on the site. So if you turn up in open shoes, we, you won't be allowed to come. So do make sure you have enclosed shoes. That's, um, probably long pants are, are, um, are sensible, but if you want to wear shorts, that's okay. Um, or... Uh, um, so yeah, so that's probably all, all you need to know. Okay. Yep. Um, there's, there's nowhere to get food out there, so there is water. We can get, yes, you can get water on the site, drinking water, but, um, but yeah, but there's nowhere to buy food. So if you, if you want lunch out there, then bring, bring food. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll see everyone there at, at 7:30, unless you're driving. Okay. Um, okay. So, so yes, okay, so today we're going to talk about mapping. So this is or visualization, and so this is lecture four. Um, the, the reading uh, so are chapter 10 from Jensen and Jensen, or chapter six and nine from Campbell and, and Shin. And um, so we're going to have a lecture on that, and then we'll have a practical uh, on, on, on uh, mapping, basically, so for cartography. And if we... Um, and there's a question associated with that that practical as well, which I'll perhaps just say a little bit about now while you're all here together. And then, um, so, so basically the idea of the practical this afternoon is, is to, um, as I've said, communication with GIS da data, geographic data is really important and it's a really powerful aspect of GIS. So this is really developing skills and developing uh, maps with information on it that's meaningful. So you'll go through a, 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 um, an exercise in developing a map um, and how you do that in GIS and how you pr produce basically a professional quality map that, that could be used in a, in a report or, 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 other, or other online application. So, um, so we're, we're going to work mainly on the, the, the idea of this is to produce a static map, so we're not going to cover sort of interactive maps. Um, I guess that's a more advanced aspect of GIS, which we don't cover in this course. Um, but um, So you'll work through an exercise and... Um, and then there's a question at the end and so you create a map and the question at the end really asks you basically to present the map okay you just need to present the map and I guess you'll be assessed on whether you you created a map that was cartographically correct um, and used um, you used used the cartographic principles that we talk, we'll talk about in this lecture and and then it asks you to um, describe the cartographic principles you use to develop the map and, uh, and for each, each of those principles, just say how it improves or you know, is effective at communicating uh, the geographic data. So, so again, there's a component here presenting the map showing you can actually do the analysis. Um, we sort of show you how to do it. Um, you like to get higher marks if you, if you improve on that map. So if there's ways you can improve on that map. Um, so that sort of covers that application aspect and then the discussion of the cartographic principles and how they improve communication is sort of the, the critical analysis component of that question. Um, but again, we're not after long answers. 
we're maximum 200 words, but you should probably be able to answer this in less than that. So it's a short answer, and we're not asking you to spend lots of time. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? What you need to do for that? Um, and again, look at the look at the marking criteria. Um, it's the same marking criteria as yesterday's question. So, yeah. Okay. But anyway, if there's any questions about that in the prax, then we can we can yeah help clarify anything that's that's not clear. Okay. And you'll have to submit today's and yesterday's question on Monday by four o'clock. Right, today's lecture. Uh, <clears throat> and and I, I presume everyone knows that there's no, other than the field trip, there's no other activities tomorrow. Okay, so I'm going to start actually by just showing you a visualization, and I think this is a really um, nice illustration of the types of visualizations you can do in, um, with the GIS. If I can cover and paste it. We're not going to do anything as fancy as this, but I think this is a... Okay, here we go. So this is a um, video of, uh, of the tracking of two honey buzzards from Europe, migration down into, into Africa. Um, and uh, they, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pair of honey buzzards and they, and they migrate from, from the Netherlands and uh, they, they lose each other on the migration and then one gets lost, I think, or they surmise that one gets lost. And then they meet again in, um, when they get back to the Netherlands. But, um, so it's a, you know, it's a love story, really. Um, <coughs> um, so, uh, but it's a, yeah, it's a really nice illustration. Of, it's a really um, excellent visualization. So I'll just show you this. It's just a minute long or so. <coughs> so those are just the tracks of the of the individual um, buzzard. So they, it's in three dimensional space. Um, So this one's lost, I believe. <laughs> That's what they say, but I don't know. I suspect it knows where it's going. <laughs> yeah, reunited. <laughs> I missed that one. <laughs> okay, so. That's a, like it's a it's a it's, it's a pretty amazing visualization. I think it's really effective at at um, illustrating the the vast distances that these um, these uh, um, that species moves and and so so those are the really um, some of the really cool visualizations you can do. And, and I think make, you know, communicating GIS data in this way is really a really powerful aspect of GIS. So we're not going to do anything like that necessarily in this course. So that's uh, creating those sorts of um, visualizations is, is quite advanced. So, but we're going to cover, I guess, some basics of, of communication. And, um, and and in this first part, we're really just going to think about cartography. And, and I think there's there's a, a few things to think about and principles that we can we can draw draw upon. And in the second half of the lecture, we're going to talk about some specific specific ways to to um, visualize different types of, of data sets in different ways. Um, 
So we're going to think about the cartographic communication process and the design, design principles. So again, these are sort of building blocks for, for thinking, about, thinking about GIS um, and how you communicate ideas and, and data. <clears throat> and so um, there's this really great book, I mean, called, called from Mark um, Mon Monnier called How to Lie with Maps, and he's a, he's a um, geographer. And really, this book is about how people through history have, have lied with maps. And it's the same way people lie with statistics. You can lie with maps. I mean, maps are quite powerful. And people believe what's on a map for some reason. I don't know why. But um, you should never believe what's on a map. Or you should question what's on a map. Um, but they've been, because of that, they've been, you know, they've been used for power, you know, gain power and, and, and so on. Um, and here's a couple of a quotes from that book. People trust maps and in... And intriguing maps attract the eye as well as connotate authority. So, and that's probably true. Like guns and crosses, maps can be good or bad, depending on who's holding them, who they're aimed at, and how they're used and why. So, so you, can, you, can, you can misinform people, essentially, with, with maps. So that's important to think about. And what you really want to do is communicate, from a scientific point of view anyway, communicate information truthfully that provides the user with the you know, accurate information that you're trying to communicate. But they can be used for good or bad. But we're only going to use them for good, right? So, so I guess I want you to think about, um, maybe just have a chat to the person next to you and think about, well, how are maps used in the discipline that you, you, um, you work in? Um, and so we want to just, just pair up with the person next to you, talk about how you think maps are used, and do you think they play a major or minor role? And then we might just have a discussion amongst the group. So perhaps do that for for a minute or two. Um, so think about that and then have a discussion with the person next to you or in your groups. I'm happy if you do it in your groups as well. We'll just do that for two minutes. Okay. <coughs> okay, how did you go? Good? Had a good bit of a discussion? Good? There was lots of people talking. You might have been talking about something completely different, but yeah, that's all right. <laughs> um, so, so what, I mean, so maybe we'll I, I have a vague idea of the different disciplines you come from. So people from, the, maybe from the conservation biology people, what, how do you think that maps are used in, in your discipline? Sorry? They use for everything. Everything? So like you wouldn't be able to um, communicate very well without them. They make the public care about right. issues that they use to make public care about issues that they're trying to solve. Okay. They use to they use general communicate all kinds of research and issues and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. So they're really quite important for communicating to the public? Yes. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Anything else? Okay. Yep. So the use for sort of understanding where things are. Yep. Right. Identifying study sites. Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. So 
So as a communication tool to... to mm. Right. Yep, 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 sure, yep. Good, good. What about, uh, what about people sort of, in may, maybe people doing more broadly environmental management? Can you think of, who's doing it sort of more environmental management, which is a bit broader? Anyone? I know there are some here. <laughs> so is there any other, you know, more broadly in managing the environment, how do you think maps are used? Land use planning. Right, land use planning, yep. So, yeah, I mean, and how, do, how are they used in that sense? Yep. 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 Definitely. So it's as we, we had an example a couple of days ago from Perth about using maps to to try yeah to communicate zoning and so on. Yep. And uh, and I think I mean you could you could do that in a bunch of tables, but the map is much more powerful. Yep. So that's a sort of planning context. Anything else? Sort of more environmental management. Other aspects that are not planning. I guess people are doing urban planning. Can you think of any other reasons why you might use use maps? Okay. Yep. Yep. So, yep. So when you're building roads. Yep. Yep. Good. What about um, people doing sort of mineral resources type work? Um, Right. Oh, right. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah, okay. So it could be informing um, staff or public. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So what's the benefit of using a map in that case as opposed to something else? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it can help communicate. Right. All right. So it might help communicate <laughs> who, how you do those things. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Anything else? Um. Okay. So that's a good. I mean, a good selection of different disciplines. And I think in, in different disciplines and different situations, you're using maps in different ways. <coughs> but but in, in in general, they're useful yeah, these days for communication. And I'm going to talk a bit now about why. Maps are different now than they used to be. Um, uh, so, but, but well, perhaps let's think about what cartography is. So, cartography is the art and science of, of uh, and technology of map mapping and the study of maps in all its aspects. Um, and so, there's a really a, a, a cartographic process uh, that that actually is. You know, we've talked a little bit about this about describing phenomena, and then you thinking of the maps, collect purpose of the data or maps collecting the data and then it's really the design and construction of the map that's really designed to communicate a particular aspect of, of that map and so the cartographic process is that that process all the way through to the design design of the map and I guess you know the goal of cartography is really to communicate spatial information um, that's effectively and efficiently efficient efficiently and uh, and I guess I've got four things here that we really want to aim for. Is it needs to be accurate, truthful. Actually, five things: complete, usable, and useful. So if you're thinking about types of characteristics of maps, those are the things we might want to aim for. But people often don't do these things on purpose. Okay. Um, so um, before GIS, cartography was really quite different, and uh, and GIS has riv driven really a big change in how maps maps are used um, and uh, and so we can ask you can use maps to rather than just depict where things are and what things are we can now query maps so we can have interactive maps we can query them we can get um, do scenarios on uh, on the fly and, and so on so we can ask things rather than just where and what we can also ask things like why when why how what if and so on okay so it's quite different um, and there's really a, a, I guess a difference between sort of old style before GIS printed maps, and no one really uses printed maps anymore, um, versus sort of the di a digital map. And I guess that the major distinction is before GIS, really the map was the, s the store of the data. 
and so we didn't have um, digital databases to store data and the map was the data so there wasn't anything else and so it sort of formed this um, this uh, uh, tool that was the storage of the data and the carrier of the data and information presenter all at the same time okay so with GIS it's different quite different now where we have the data storage are really in our geo databases and, and data storage facilities and, and, and so on and the the um, communication of the map is really the the, um, the communication um, tool it's really so we've sort of separated out the data storage from the communication but it means we can be much more flexible so that the you know the um, the development of maps can be sort of independent of, of the data data storage okay. and and I guess one of the things that's happened is that that it's become much more user centered so GIS information is become user centered so there's been a lot of development in how what do users want and how, what do they need in a digital digital world and so there's been this very rapid um, change in the use of maps um, and, and and I mean you no one as I said no one really uses um, paper maps anymore so we're all using sort of inter often interactive um, digital maps and and GIS has, has driven a lot of that a lot of that change towards a much more user centered focus so so lots of innovation in that space um, so and I guess you know I guess this sort of captures what what the difference is so um, uh, in terms of the the um, differences between GIS model and and the sort of traditional model of, of communication um, uh, you know we, we maps can also provide you know a range of things like real-world support animation of simulation process we can predict you know, have dynamic maps that predict um, future scenarios and, and have inbuilt modeling in them that can illustrate changes over time which we can interrogate and so I think they you know these interactive maps and dynamic maps are really the, the big big change from from how how maps were portrayed in the past okay. so that's so that's I guess a bit of a summary on, on where things how things have changed and why they're different but the key take-home message from that is that now really the, the, the mapping is not the data carrier or the or the data store it's actually a communication tool so it's really about communication okay. um, so I guess I'll just mention bias in maps we we have seen uh, I showed you a video from that, that West Wing video about projections about bias in, in maps and that's an example of bias and so bias can be used used for for good or evil or but ultimately we really want to minimize bias um, but the key point is that actually you make these decisions about what your your map should show but there, there are a lot of value judgments in that so they're they're not sort of neutral maps we're really trying to show a particular often trying to show a particular viewpoint um, uh, or um, and so so two maps that are trying to show different viewpoints could be quite different so that's really important to recognize that, uh, that, that we, maps are often used to show particular viewpoints and that's true when you create maps so you, you're showing a particular viewpoint and that's when you're reading maps and interpreting maps that's important to recognize um, and, and I guess in historically you know those maps have been generated from you know influenced by the dominant philosophies or paradigms at each time in history and, and they often reflect the dominant power of the time as, as, as we saw in that West Wing video uh, things like map projection can affect that this could be data accuracy issues you could show uh, data that reflected in the map as if they're much more accurate than they really are um, and that in, and that relates partly to some you know, potentially to human errors influencing that as well so you know reflecting data that's that's project you know, depicted to be much more accurate than it is is essentially a you know it's 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 lying with maps so that's important to recognize and and I guess when you're reading maps it's important to bear these things in mind okay. um, so with those things in mind how do we how do we start to um, design maps or, and, and I think what I'm going to go through is really a set of principles that you can use to design maps and, and what I want you to think about when you're in the practical later is it's so the practical will sort of show you some of the tools in ArcGIS for creating maps but I think what I want you to think about when doing that are what are some of the principles you might use in developing developing those maps um, and I, I guess this is a, a quote from 
um, Tuft, Tufty maybe, or Tuft, I don't know, 1983, about sort of what, um, uh, I guess it's capturing this idea that, you know, uh, the, that, there, you know, that what goes into a map, the data that goes into a map is important and what the maps need to, need to achieve. So this was just said, the best designs are intriguing and curiosity provoking, drawing the viewer into the wonder of the data, sometimes by narrative power, sometimes by immense detail, and sometimes by elegant presentation of simple but interesting data. But no information, no sense of discovery, no wonder, no substance is generated by chart junk. So, so I guess it's saying, you know, in, 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 uh, in some ways it should be as simple as possible, um, but communicate clearly uh, and, and uh, with, um, with intrigue the, the data that you're, you're trying to present. Um, but you refer to this thing as sort of um, chart junk as if you, know, you can get really bad maps that tell you nothing. Um, okay, so, so we'll go through some, I'm going to go through some, some cartographic uh, principles that allow you to think about how, how do we design maps that are informative and um, intriguing at the same time but accurate. Okay. Uh, so we need to understand the nature of maps. Uh, and good under, I guess good maps under, you know, re require understanding of how the map will be used. So when you're developing a map, think about who the audience is. Who do you want to communicate this to? So if you're communicating a complex map to a scientist, for instance, you may create, you'll probably, well, almost certainly create a very different map to if you're going to try to portray the same information to the general public, for instance. So, so an expert versus non-expert. So quite different maps. So, um, so think about who, who the who the map is, map is for. So again, this comes back to that user-centered focus of, of GIS maps. Um, so that's one of the key things. So, so yeah, um, I guess in the practice today, we don't specify who the user is, but when you're developing maps, so you're developing your, you know, your maps for your reports, when you do your project, um, think about who, who, who's it for, the map, okay? And in that case, it's for whoever's marking your assignment, right? So and that's who you want to communicate to. So what, how you present your map will, will differ depending on who the audience is. Um, so, so I guess there's, there's a few map design principles that I'm going to go through. One is, is, um, is legibility, and really we want to aim for things that are easy to read and understand. I mean, some of these are just common sense, but I think it's worth bearing them in mind. Um, we, might, we want to think about visual contrast, and, and this is really... Um, Contrast between the data that you're of interest and the background. So you want, we want things. We don't want things. We want things to be visually contrast. If they're different things, they should be displayed as different objects or colours and so on. So contrast is really important. Um, and I guess in in, um, in the con context of that, this thing called figure ground organisation is, is important. So this is this idea that you have you have a figure or a, or the data of interest, and then you have some background. So that yeah, that that the stuff you're in, the, the stuff you're interested in, the map needs to design to, so that the stuff you're interested in draws the the, the viewer in and it doesn't get distracted by the background. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, and then there's some you know thing called sort of hierarchical structure, which is about really the relationships between between uh, objects. So things that are are similar should look similar. So they they should if they're they're similar type things. They should look similar. If they're differences, they look, should look differences. Di just, sorry, they should look different. And then it should, map should reflect the interrelationships between, between objects as well. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll look a little bit at that. At that. Okay. Okay. So, um, so just some examples of legibility and, and contrast. And again, map making, remember, map making, map making is an art. It's not a science. And, uh, and so there's no, in some ways, not right or wrong. But I'm just going to give you some examples of, of, of legibility. Okay. So, so this is just an example. If you had some 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 points, then you know this this is much more. You know, this is much clear. The contrast here is much clear between the, the circle and the dot. This is not this is not great. Oh. Trees. This is perhaps too intricate. This is good. So again, principles of keeping things simple but portraying the information information you want. Um, this is an example of poor contrast. So we have two different, maybe these are two different roads, or maybe two different types of boundary. Um, but you can't 
just looking at them, you can't really distinguish between the two. So that's much better contrast, okay? So you can very clearly see they're different. If these were very similar boundaries or roads, then you might want them to look similar, okay? So think about what they are and what you want to portray. Okay. And again, you know, there's a balance between complexity and simplicity. So these might be, might be contours. Uh, so this, this is a case where there's really too many uh, cont contours or two numbers. They're very cluttered together. Um, there's probably too many numbers here as well, so it still looks fairly cluttered. But this shows the same information, but in a much simpler, clearer way. So, so that might be a bit better. But again, it's a bit of judgment here. So there's no, these are just suggestions. So really you're looking for simplicity and clarity um, and, and contrast. Okay. okay. So figure ground contrast. So this is... Um, this is um, the, a map of, an old map actually, of Pan American Airlines um, flights um, in sort of middle, middle America, Central America, okay? So can anyone see where the ocean is and the land is? Can you see the difference? It's hard, right? Yeah, because basically here... I mean, the focus is on the airports and, and, um, and, and locations between them, but you sort of, you, there's no, um, you can't really orient yourself in, in where, where that is, partly because they just don't have this, this contrast between the data of interest, which are the airports and the, and the land areas and the, and, the, and the ocean areas. So you could, so in this case, the, the land-sea contrast is poor, and, and and so you can't distinguish from actually the data you're trying to bring out in the map and the background, which is really the, the ocean. Okay? So that's an example of poor figure ground con contrast. So when you're developing a, a map, try to, uh, try to make sure you have a contrast between what's the background and, and the, the, the foreground or the data of interest. Um, really important. Okay? This, so this is not a great map. Right, so there's some, I guess, some, some principles to think about in terms of how you develop a map. But what about map design and, and, and layout? So there's, I guess there's no single standard to follow, as with the sort of um, this, uh, aesthetics of the, uh, so I guess, sorry, the, um, you know, these things like figure ground contrast and simplicity. But I guess there's some, a few uh, guidelines on how you should, what you should include in your map. So... The layout will sort of depend on the audience and the, the type of document you're preparing it for. But there are a, a few basic elements that should be included in, in any map. Okay. So, so let's go through some of these, these basic, basic elements. Um, so what you should have on all maps are a measure of scale, and I'm going to talk about scale in a moment, direction, a legend, and, and a lineage, which is so let me go. Well, let me go through through um, through each of these in a minute. So we'll we'll talk about scale in a moment. Scale basically represents the the distances on on that map. So it might be a scale bar. It could be a measure of the the, the, the ratio. Of, and I'll talk about these again in a moment. The ratio between the distance on a on the ground versus on the map. Various ways to show that, but that captures how big the map. What what size area the map is. Direction refers to which direction is basically north. So often we show what's known as the north arrow, shows which direction is north so you can orient yourself. Legend tells you what the different symbols and colors mean in your, in your map. Without that, you don't, you're no way of knowing what the map is. And lineage basically tells you where, where the map's from, so who created it and so what was the data and so on and, and the process for, for generating that. Generally, in many cases, this, we're less picky about this, but certainly every map should have a scale bar or some sort of scale measure, some direction, and some legend. So if, you, um, if you're doing assignments for this course and you leave those out, you get marked out. So, be very, so, don't, um, so every map should have those three things on, okay? Because the maps are very diff difficult to interpret. So that's sort of the, the rule number one. So some things that are really sensitive to context and, and may or may not have them on, 
uh, on the maybe, you know, it might have the title, the projection that you used. So maps can be, you know, a, a map on a flat surface has got to be in a projection. So you could say what the projection is. Um, cartographer, who the cartographer is, and the date of production could also be there. But those are less um, mandatory, but they're, they're things that you might want to, want to consider. Um, and then you could use some of these things for, um, uh, you know, for effective communication. So uh, neat lines. So you'll find out what a neat line is today in the PRAC. Um, you might have a locator or ins insert um, map uh, in your... So these might be, you know, you see these... these uh, Maps where you where you have um, a, a small um, uh, in insert which shows where you know, Brisbane is in Australia, for instance. So that's an insert map or or, um, or locator locator map. Um, actually, I'm not quite sure. An index map. Yeah, I'll have to find out. I'm not sure what an index map is actually, um, but um, I'll find out for you. Yeah. yeah. So lineage really is is the so where the where the map came from. So the, the data and, um, you know, just the, the yeah, where, where, that, where that information came from. Yeah, really. Okay. What, what would be the example? Um, I, I guess you would write the data source. So where the data source was from. Um, it includes some of this. It can include some of this stuff, actually, who the cartographer was and the date of, date of production and so on. So it's really... I'm less picky about that, but it depends on the context. So, yeah. Like if you're writing it for a scientific paper, that information is usually in the text of the paper, so you probably I'd rarely say that. But yeah. 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 Okay, so let's look at each of these anyway, um, briefly. So map scale. Uh, so map scale is basically, so we've talked about scale, and we talked about scale yesterday. This is a completely different concept of scale. And... Uh, we talked about extent and resolution yesterday. What map scale is, is race basically the ratio of um, distances on the, uh, on the map compared to distances in the real world. So and often, often can be represented as, as um, a ratio. So you can say the distances um, you know, in the real world are maybe 100,000 times bigger than distances on the map, okay? So it gives you a concept of scale. Um, but there are basically three ways of representing that map scale on a, on, uh, map, scale on a map. So, so the first one uh, is, is ratio scale. So we can actually say what the ratio is. So we can say every one centimeter on the map might be 4,000 centimeters. If it was one to 4,000, 4, we would say every one centimeter on the map is 4,000 centimeters on, on, in the real world. That's a 1 to 4,000 scale. A 1 to 250,000 scale says 1 centimetre on the map is 250,000 centimetres in the real world. Okay. So it gives you a sense for the scale. So the bigger, the bigger this um, number is, the bigger this number is, the, the bigger extent the map represents. Okay. All right. So that's one way of showing the scale on a map. The other way, one other way is a verbal scale, and you hardly ever see this, but you can just write. One unit on the map represents 100,000 uh, 100, units in the real world. Basically says the same information there, but a verbal scale. I've hardly ever seen that. Um, but it is possible. The other way is a graphical scale. So this is graphical scale. I mean, you might have scale bars that actually shows how big 100 kilometers is, for instance, on, a, on the map. So an example... This might be a, a scale bar. Okay. So this says on the map, uh, that's, they say that distance from there to there is 12 kilometers. And so often you can see, you can combine these two. You could show, show the ratio scale, but also show a scale bar. Yeah. My, my recommendation is always use a scale bar. You can use both, but I find that the, for communication purposes, actually just showing the ratio doesn't actually give you a really good sense for what the scale of the map is. Okay. So I would always recommend a scale bar, really. And, and, yeah, and that's the reason why you know, I think the graphic form is, is more useful. Okay. Right, so that's, so that's scale. Okay. Um, so what about use of colour? 
So colour can be really useful for distinguishing between different, different um, elements of the map. And there's three dimensions of colour we can use. There's, there's hue, and really the hue is, the, is essentially the, the colour. It's the dominant wavelength, so whether it's red, blue, yellow, um, and so on. Um, the value, which is how dark or light, light it is. So, um, so actually we've got the, so this, is, this is differences in hue, differences, differences in colour. Um, this is uh, differences in value, so going from dark to light. So we can have dark or light values. Or, um, and then the final thing is saturation, so the purity of the wave, wavelength. So if it's a pure red, it's going to look a bit like this, for instance, and this is, an, this is sort of a mixture of wavelengths, so it's less pure. Okay? So you can, in some ways you can, you can choose colours that, that vary across these three, three axes. So, so they can be used. So you, could, you can use, you know, if things were, were similar, we might have red colours, we may want to change saturation, for instance, to, to represent similar things that, that vary in some, some aspect. So, so it might be... Um, agricultural fields that we're representing as a red colour and we might use saturation to represent how the yield of those fields varies across space. Okay, right. So that's sort of colour, how we might use colour. Symbols and signs. So symbols and signs are really, really important. Um, a few principles to think about. Um, similar symbols represent similar, similar objects and different, different symbols mean differences in reality. So don't use the same symbol to mean different things. We can, we can use symbols to order things. So we can use sizes of symbols to, to represent different si um, you know, values. So we could have sizes of a symbol for representing cities that are where, the, where the, 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 maybe it's a circle we're using and big circles represent big cities with large numbers of people and small circles represent small cities with small numbers of people. So that's a way in which we can use use um, symbols to represent values and we'll, af after the break in a minute we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how you might use those. Um, so that, that can represent ordering, okay? Or, or, or um, continuous variables. Um, and we can use proportions too, so we can use symbols that have proportions, which I'll show you some examples soon where you have, have um, uh, symbols where we, ha we can represent proportions of different components of a, of a, of a local government area or, or so on. So we can, we can represent values in, in lots of innovative ways. Um, so some more examples of using shape, color, and orientation. Uh, so we can, we can use different shapes of, of symbols. So you know, the, these are different colors and shapes, but we can, you know, the, these, um, these represent very different things. Here's an example using using hue, different colours to represent woods, marsh, open open water. We can use patterns as well. So again, we're not using different colours here, but we're using patterns to represent different uh, different land covers in this sense. And in this case, using orientation of lines. So actually, the pattern is the same. We're just changing the orientation. So some really innovative ways in which you can actually distinguish different different values or different types of geographic features from each other. So, um, I guess to end this sort of section, so in, in terms of digital mapping, do's and, do's and don'ts, um, the, uh, I guess some things to think about is, is you know, be careful with, with software default settings, don't just use the default settings, think about who your map's for and, and, and why you're, you're, you're developing, developing that map. Uh, so use graphical scale rather than verbal or ratio scale, okay? So I, I think it's better to use those scales if you have, have the ratio scale. It's, it's not so meaningful for people. Um, so I guess remember also um, when you're changing the dimensions of a map, don't just change the vertical or horizontal dimensions. It's pretty difficult to do in ArcGIS. So it, it pretty much maintains that for you, but you, know, you, can't, you don't really want to exaggerate the vertical scale at the expense of the horizontal scale, but I think that's almost impossible to do in ArcGIS. And then the last thing is, um, yeah. but, but actually, now when you convert it to a, when you convert it to an image, so what you'll do actually is, is you create the maps in, in the GIS and then you'll often, you'll save it as a, a JPEG or something. 
then it's possible to change one scale rather than the other. So you might import it into a document, and then if you exaggerate the vertical scale, um, you can exaggerate the vertical scale and not the horizontal scale. So although it's hard to do in a GIS, once you convert it to an image, it is possible to do. So, so avoid doing that. And then the last thing is be a skeptical map, map reader. So don't believe maps. I know everyone does, but don't believe them. Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, what I'm going to do now is actually do a little exercise. And we're going to have some fun critiquing some maps. Um, so I want you to, and I didn't do any printouts, which I probably should have done, but anyway, if people can access the lectures on, the, on Blackboard, then you can, you can see these maps. But what I want you to do in your groups is look at each map and then and critique, critique them in terms of the map principles. And I want you to think about, about six things. Uh, whether they got a legend, whether they got a direction, um, whether they do something about scale bar, what they do in, in terms of color palette, do they use sensible colors that distinguish things that are different from each other? From each other? Um, is it consistent? So are they, you know, did they have, where they have symbols in one location representing one thing, is that consistent in another location? Um, and are they complete? So I'm not telling you who these maps are for, you can, you can think about who those maps might be for and, and, and critique them in the, in the context of, of, of that. So I don't, I don't know who these are for, but we can, you can think about that. Um, so basically, just want you in your groups basically to, to critique the maps and really think about how you might improve them. So you can fill out the, the, this table if you want. Um, you don't have to. I mean, I just want you to discuss each of these, and we'll go through it as a class. Um, so as I said, I didn't print anything out, but if people have got access to Blackboard, at least someone in your group, then, um, then you can view, view the maps. But I'll, you know, but maybe, sorry? Sorry? Five's best, sorry, yeah. yeah. Or you can say good or bad. We'll just have a discussion, you don't have to. Yeah, if you want to give them a score, yeah. Well, we'll maybe give them a score. So we've got that map. We've got three maps. That map. And um, well, we've got four maps. So maybe each group can pick one. Again, don't do them all. They'll take you too long. So we're only going to do this for ten minutes. Um, uh, so I'll... So just pick one. And and discuss it, okay? And then we'll have a discussion as a, as a, as a class, okay? So can I, each group can, I, can I actually see one? Yeah? I think everyone's got... I see a few laptops around, so we should, yeah. So maybe just arrange yourself so you can actually see the map. Or if someone's got a print off, that'd be useful. Okay, so let's do that for 10 minutes, and then we'll have a short discussion together.
Hey. Um, okay, how did your, your map bashing go? Um, I'll bring up the, hold on a second. Okay, there we go. So, oh no. Okay. Right, let's just go through them anyway quickly and see what people thought. Again, I haven't really said who these maps are for, so sometimes the answers depend on who the map are for. So this is a map probably, I don't know, I don't think these are, they look like bicycles or something, I don't know. Anyway, some, yeah, something like that. Um, so what do you think? I mean, yeah. Does it, is it, does it have a good legend? No. Ah, so I say, yeah, maybe they're bicycles, I don't know. So actually, the map doesn't tell me what it's showing. Okay, um, so it looks like it's showing some cities, but not others, so yeah, the legend's really, there's no legend, so we don't know. So, Direction? No, no. pretty poor direction. Scale bar? No. Um, I guess color palette really is about, you know, has it chosen the right colors to show different things? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah, probably. Yep. Consistency, has it applied these sort of rules of colors consistently across the map? Or? Yeah, so that's okay. Um, and is it complete? No. Well, yeah. I mean, actually, we don't know because we don't know what it's showing us. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, it may not be. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, probably not. Okay. I mean, if these were major cities, yeah. Then, and again, because it doesn't have a legend, it's hard to tell. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. So, so hopefully none of you will produce a map like that. So that's the type to avoid. What about this one? Legend? No, it doesn't. Although, it does have the names of the states. So, you know, in some ways, that, that's another way you could, you could represent this. So we do, it does have some information. In, in a sense, that's, that's in place of a legend. So I think that's probably okay. It is missing ACT, so it's not complete. Yep. So, yeah, so it's missing ACT. So it should have, it should, yeah, it's not a complete map. Okay, so probably that, yeah, so completeness, dodgy, legend, maybe, okay. Direction? No, no direction. Scale? No. Color palette? Yeah, so it hasn't show, yeah, it hasn't used the color palette. Um, yeah, it hasn't, yeah, it's not the right, I mean, although it just distinguished different colors. So we had a discussion over here about whether, because they're the same color, whether that's a color palette issue or just a consistency issue. They've sort of applied a different rule to Victoria and Tasmania compared to the other states. Um, but it's possible they're slightly different colors, but you just can't see them. I think they are slightly different colors. So in that case, it's actually, it actually hasn't chosen very good colors. There's no contrast yet. So that's a, yeah. So I think that's important. So it's either consistency or color palette. Okay? Good. Not a great map either. Um, okay. What about this one? And I guess this is sort of a, probably a tourist map maybe, showing some of the roads and national parks and, and so on. I'm not 100% sure. But it's got some elements, some yeah, components. What about um, legend for this one? No, it doesn't have a legend. So it's a bit like, the, it, it doesn't really tell you what the different roads are and the and the green areas and so on. I'm guessing the green areas are national parks, but you could have some more information about that. So that's not great. Direction? Yep. Scale bar? Yep. Color palette? Is the color used in such a way it distinguishes different things from each other? Yeah, it's okay. Yep. Consistency? Are things consistent across the map? Yes, no? More or less. Looks okay. And is it complete? Yeah. Well, again, it's a little hard to know, and I guess you know who it's for, but yeah, it, it looks reasonably complete. Yep. Okay, and then this last one is a map by, land cover map by Geosciences Australia. And if anyone knows how to create maps, it should be Geosciences Australia, you'd hope. So let's see if they got it, got it right. Um, uh, what about um, legend? Yeah. Direction? No. So actually, 
In some ways, this is a bit of a trick one, um, and I didn't mention this when I was talking about direction, but another way to show direction is to show a grid rather than a north arrow. Often we put a north arrow on a map, but in this case, you can just see it here, but if you look at your electronic version, you can probably see it better. They've shown the latitudes and longitudes, the grid of latitude and longitude. That's okay, so because you can still orient yourself. If you know, if you know um, which ones are latitude and longitude, you know, you're, you know this is the north-south, okay? So, so that's, that's a diff another way of showing your, um, your direction, okay? So I think, I think we'll let them off on that one. Um, scale bar? It does? Yep, somewhere? Yep, okay, good, yep, does. Color palette? Yep, so it's sort of different land uses, land cover, sorry, are distinguished with different colors quite well. Yep. Is it consistent? Yep. And complete? Yeah, okay. So they pass. They did a good job. I mean, it's sort of, in some ways, this, the, this is a very complicated map. It's probably not the sort of map you might give to a non-expert but it's probably designed for experts in the area. So, so, that's, um, so I think that's okay. So you might, if you were trying to create a map of land cover types for the general public, you might want to take out and some of the detail and simplify, perhaps. But that's a, again, that's a choice about who you, who you, your choice and how, who you're creating the map for. Okay, good. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a, a sense for some principles that we can use for creating maps. Right. Okay, so I'm going to go through this next bit relatively quickly because we don't have much time. Um, but the idea of this second part of the, the lecture is really to, to look at a particular type of um, mapping called thematic mapping and data classification, and we'll look very quickly at 3D visualization, okay, but I'll just, I'll just basically more or less say the types of things you can do with 3D visualization. So when we're thinking about thematic maps, we're, we're, I'll ex we're thinking about um, different types of data and trying to represent different types of data. Um, uh, often, we're often thinking about trying to represent different types of data, and I'm just going to remind you of the different types of data being nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. So we're actually for thematic maps, trying to represent often values, okay? Um, and what do thematic maps do? Essentially, they, they are maps that represent, trying to represent the spatial structure of a particular theme. So, and ra rather than, than um, you know, a, a broad range of, of geographic phenomena like, um, you know, you wouldn't, you, a thematic map generally wouldn't include roads and buildings and, and you know, multiple themes all at once. We're thinking about a single theme, so it might be something like um, uh, uh, average age or, um, or the amount of forest cover in particular areas. So these are, these are usually focused around particular, particular themes. And we're interested in understanding this, using the map to communicate something about the, the spatial structure of that, of, that, of that data. And we do that by using symbols or, or colors, okay? Um, so we can use things like point symbols, dots, proportional circles, um, different size circles, and so on. Um, we can use um, colors to represent, uh, using area symbols to represent different values in different areas. These are a particular type of thematic map called a choropleth map that we'll, we'll look at in a, in a moment. And, and then we might use line symbols. So these are isolines of... of of isolines are areas of similar values, so, um, so if you're representing, you, know, you might represent uh, similar elevations, for instance, um, or, or flow lines, so we can use line symbols. So we can have a look at all of these. But why, why might, what's, you got some examples of why, what we might use thematic maps for? In, in the, if, what's, well, have you ever used them before? What have you used them for? In your work or your study, you can, right? So you use different maps to represent how things change over time. Yep, yep. Have you got an example of that that you might have come across before? <laughs> mm, 
Right, so there's a whole range, so you've come across them, yeah. Yep, so you can, yep. You can actually use thematic maps to represent change, like you can use these um, line symbols, you can, you can use lines to actually represent direction of change over time, and I'll show you an example of that in, in a moment. Anything else? What, when have people come across thematic maps before? How to? Showing habitat differences. Oh, habitat differences? Yep, yep. So there might be some measure of a different type of habitat. Yep. yep. Population. population. So yeah, you often see maps of populations of particular areas. Yep. yep. So they're widely used, and, and, and we probably, if we sat down and think about it, you probably see them all the time. Um, so, um, but again, we, we're going to sort of think about some, some principles we might use to develop good Thematic, thematic maps. Um, so, so I guess there's, um, so there's two types of data perhaps we might want to think about. Uh, we might think about quantitative maps. In this case, I mean sort of um, quantitative continuous variables. So things like population, income, land values. Maps show variation in those values across from place to place. And, uh, and we, we can, although I said, you know, thematic maps are, are really about a, a single theme, actually we can show multiple variables. So we might show something like population size and income, for instance, and I'll, I'll show you an example using th at the end, using 3D mapping, how we can visualize multiple, uh, multiple uh, values or multiple variables. Okay. Um, uh, but we can also show, um, have qualitative maps. So qualitative maps are really related to uh, um, uh, categorical data. So we're thinking about ordinal or, um, or nominal data. And, you know, things like um, locations of a particular type of object or distributions of national parks. I've got some examples here. Um, patterns of industrial land use and, and so on. So these are categorical, categorical data. And in this case, we're often thinking about representing those categories and, and where they are in, in relation to, to each other. Okay? But if you've got multiple categories, we might be looking at relationships between types of categories. So I guess there's a bit of a distinction between the continuous quantitative data and more qualitative, qualitative categorical data. Okay. So if we've got, if we're thinking about um, uh, um, locations of things, then, then we can, we can, the easiest, simplest way to represent that data is just a, what's known as a dot map, okay? So we can just put dots on a, on a map, and um, I can't remember what this is. These are, um, uh, th this, I think this is a species from the Atlas of Living Australia. I can't remember which species it is. Um, but um, actually, no, I've got it written down here. It's just the Aust Australian magpie, okay? So they occur everywhere in Australia, okay? There's, um, there's, there's 650,000 records in the Atlas of Living Australia. So they just, they just uh, occur, occur everywhere. But this is not very meaningful, is it? I mean, it doesn't really say, tell us anything about the, the, the distribution of, of um, Australian magpie, apart from the fact that they pretty much occur everywhere, apart from here. So it's not really that useful. Okay. So, but in some cases, they can be, say, they can be an easily understand, uh, understood pictorial representation. And, um, but there are some issues with it. So one of the key issues that is represented here is they, I guess they can't handle... Um, a great range of, of data. Um, so you've got, you've probably got large variation in the number of locations, but it, you just can't, um, you can't see them. So the, 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 the range of data from, from, you can sort of see where they're not and where they are, but that's about it. So it doesn't really represent the, the range of data. And so, and then it's partly the fact that the placement of dots on top of each other can be misleading. So we can't detect um, that, that variation very, very well. So one thing we can do is think about um, area symbols and, and we can aggregate things into areas and then in that case we might want to calculate the number of dots, for instance, within a particular area which might represent the density of dots, for instance. And so, um, so we can use, I mean, these are, these are some, some examples uh, of area symbols. This is, these are differences in, in, in quantities. Um, so these are... Uh, um, uh, per, uh, under, under one year deaths per thousand live births. So, okay, so shows um, the variation in the, the, the proportion of, of deaths under one year old across the different states. 
So that's a, an example of using you know, that, that information to, in an area symbol to represent different values. We can, we can also show categorical data. So this is, just, um, uh, this is just categorical data of different countries. So we've got categorical data using area symbols. Okay. So we can do that in area symbols. If we've got locations and we want to show some information about particular themes at particular locations, one innovative way you can do that is, is using these, um, uh, these proportional symbols where I think these are um, where the circles of different cities in Germany are rep represented by circles and then essentially the pie chart uh, represents the, the contribution. So, so the, actually, this, I think this is the economic production of major industries. So the bigger the circle, the more economic production. And then within that, we've got a pie chart which shows the contribution of each, each of those, those industries. So this is a, like a really can be a, a very nice way of actually displaying lots of information in a, on a particular theme um, very, very concisely. And so, you know, if you... Um, and you can do this in ArcGIS. There's some nice functionality to be able to do these types of things. So you can create some really nice um, informative maps. Okay. So those area symbols and sort of point symbols or proportional symbols. Um, what about line symbol maps? Um, the, these, these are often represented to use to represent features that have a length. We're interested in the length of the line. And, um, and some, you know, um, but I don't, you know, as you know, a line has basically a length in a, the line data stru structure, data model, has length but doesn't have any width. So it doesn't have any area. So examples might be um, things without numerical significance. They might be political boundaries. They could have some sort of um, uh, qualitative um, value associated with them. So you might have boundaries for the state versus boundaries for local governments. So they, they don't have any quantitative measures attached to them. But some do have numerical values. So um, things like um, ISO lines that represent areas of equal, equal value, um, such as you know, ISO bars and, and so on. Okay. So these are some examples of ISO, ISO line maps. This is temperature, I think. Uh, temperature here. Um, so everywhere along each of these lines is the same temperature. And this is elevation. Okay. So these are just, just contours representing elevation. So another example of the way we can visualize um, elevation or temperature. And um, uh, so, so these are using, using these line symbols. Okay. And this is an interesting, so we were talking, talking earlier about change through time. So this is an example of using line uh, symbols for a, to represent a particular theme. In this case, this is um, you know, movement between places, and this is the shifts in bird species across Australia due to, essentially, over time. Um, and, and this is this was a study where they related them to climate change. And um, each, each arrow represents, I can't remember what time period this, this is over, I think over about 50 or 60 years. And each arrow represents a different species, and the center of the range moves from along that, direct, that particular direction, and the length of the line represents how far that, that species has moved. So you can sort of get a sense by visualizing here that, that the movement of species. So a lot of species have been moving south here um, and, and um, sort of north, northwest up here, but it's a bit different down here. So you can really get a sense for the variation in those movement patterns across Australia and how they vary. So I think that's a really, really nice example of using um, lines to represent change over time. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about a particular type of thematic map quickly called choropleth mapping. And this is, this is some of those, some examples I've already showed you. Um, but this is really using areas or points to represent um, uh, values, well, um, in, in areas using graduated colors. So this is where it's continuous data or, or, or quantitative data. And we're trying to represent different values. So it could be population size, income. The example I've given here is the um, uh, amount of you know, biodiversity. I think it's um, uh, number, of, number of species, particular area. 
So we've got quantitative measures, and we want to, we're going to represent those values across, across a map. Okay? And, and one of the things we need to think about when we're doing that, when we've got, say, population size or population density, for instance, we need to think about how do we classify them. Okay? How do we represent those values across that range? And often we'll need to color things in different colors. So we want the low, might, might, might want the low values represented with the blue, all the way up to a red, for instance, at the high values and values in between. So if we want to do that, we need to classify the data. Okay? We need to classify it into different bands so we can um, color each band uh, dif differently. Okay. So, so we might have raw data, and to visualize it, we want to, we want to classify. And there's, there's different ways in which we can do this, this classification. Okay? Um, and there's, there's, um, there's a link here where you can read about these different, different, different classification methods, but I'm just going to cover a couple um, now, but you can read in the readings about the different types of classification and this link here. So I'm going to look at, um, and the choice of classification matters because you can, you can change the information quite dramatically for, for the same underlying data. You can change the information that's displayed or, or communicated quite dramatically by, by altering the, the classification method. So um, think carefully about which classification method you use. Okay? Um, so I'm going to look at, the, I've, I've listed a few here. So one's a defined interval, and this is really where you, um, so if you think about, when you do this in ArcGIS, which you'll, you'll, um, you can play around with a bit today, you, you, when you do a classification for your, for your symbology, you get a distribution of the data, and there are various standard ways that our, the GIS will classify things for you, and then color each band, each class a, a different color. But you can do that manually. So you can actually choose the, the boundaries of the classes that you want. Okay? Um, quantile will, will, will base your, your, um, uh, your, your classifications with equal numbers of observations within your bounds. Um, Natural Jenks tries to find um, your, your you know, places where there's a natural break or, or a, or a, a um, steep transition from one value to another, and I'm going to show you a bit more of that in a moment. Um, geometric interval uses a geometric distribution to try and get classifications. It's a sort of compromise between quantile, quantile and natural, natural breaks. And the standard deviation basically uses, calculates the standard deviation of the data and, and builds um, uh, breaks between your different classes based on the standard deviation. Um, but how does it work, and, and why might we use one or the other? So I'm going to look at three. So, so we, let's assume we have this data here. If we want to apply an equal area classification, e, sorry, equal interval classification, we basically look at the range of the data, and then, so in this case, the range of the data is 480. We want three classes in this case. We divide by three, so each class has to be 160 uh, values, sorry, a, a, a size of 160. So class one is going to be from 35 to 195, that's 160, and includes those values. Class 2 is another 160, includes those values. And class 3 um, is, is another 160 wide and includes those values. So the defined interval is basically just saying we just have equal sized intervals. And that's useful when, when we want to capture the variation, we want to just visualize the variation across the whole range of the data. That's when the equal interval is useful. Quantile breaks, on the other hand, what it does, it says, right, let's find intervals that have the same number of observations in them. Okay? So here we've got nine numbers, and we're going to divide them into three categories. Okay? So if we've got nine numbers, and we want three categories, we have to have three observations in each category. Okay? So in that case, and then we order them, and then the first class has the first three numbers in, the second class has the third three numbers in, and the third class has the, th the last three numbers in. And that defines the boundaries. And so, so these values can be colored one thing. Sorry. Um, th these can be colored one thing, then these will be colored something else, and these something else. This is what tends to happen with these, because you get few observations at the extremes of the data values, it tends to ex obscure um, the, the differences at the extremes but really emphasizes differences in the middle of the values. So you tend to get this, yeah, lots of variation in color 
and representation in the middle, but not at the extremes. So, so if you want to emphasize changes in extremes, you wouldn't use a quantile breaks. And then the last one is natural breaks, um, nat natural um, Jenks breaks. And here what, what the, it has an algorithm, the GIS has an algorithm, it says, well, let's just find the locations, if we order all the values, let's find the locations where there's big jumps from one value to another. So this is looking for natural discontinuities in the data. So in this case, if we ordered all these values, there's sort of a jump here, and there's a jump here. And so the algorithm would probably tend to find a, a break there and a break there. So, and then that would be your classification. This is really useful for when you, your, your aim is to actually just show where are these natural discontinuities in the data. And that, so, so the way you classify data depends on how, what you want to communicate and how you want to communicate it. Um, you can lie a lot with these things because if you've got lots of variation in the extremes of your data that you want to hide, you can just use the quantile breaks and that hides all that variation and can just, you can show something to the audience that, that is in the, well, it'll obscure aspects of the data you might want to, want to hide for some reason. So, yeah. So, th th I think people use these types of things for the wrong reasons quite often. Um, but again, you need to think carefully about the audience and what you want to show. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm just going to finish quickly with a bit on 3D mapping. And um, so... ArcGIS does have a 3D mapping functionality, and it's called Arc, a, a component called ArcScene. Um, so that's something you can you can have a have a play around with. Um, but I think what what can what's 3D mapping useful for? Well, it can be useful for for one thing. It can be useful for is showing multiple types of data in, a, in an interesting interesting way. Um, so this might be a. I mean, here's some some different sets of sets of data. So this is just a novel way of showing the number of um, private renters in southeast Queensland, number of dwellings and, and homeowner owner purchases. And then it's showing these as, as height. So it's really a, a quite a nice, some, some cases can be a nice way of visualizing, visualizing data. And I mean the second thing it can do, as I, as I sort of alluded to just then, was that we can show multiple sets of data in an interesting way. So this is an um, example of um, these are um, these are the capacity of GPs in different. And this is in Logan, I think, and this is the capacity of, of um, GPs, which is the blue. So that's service capacity, and then the red dots are the distribution of patients. So we've basically shown in a 3D image the capacity of the GPs, and then the red dots are the, really the demand for that for that capacity. So again. We can use a 3D representation of the Earth's surface to depict multiple, multiple themes, essentially. So it can be a really useful way of, of doing that. Okay. It can also be used for 3D visualization. And so there is a, um, if you have an image that you want of a, an aerial photograph or an image of a landscape and you have a digital elevation model, we can use the GIS to drape over the, it's called draping over the, the the, um, the digital elevation models to create a realistic looking, looking image. So here's an example of, I don't know where this is, of a mountain and so on, where it's basically just draped over this, this um, aerial photograph onto the digital elevation model and, and created a 3D, 3D image. And that's something you can do in Arc, ArcGIS as well. There's a few things, and you can have a play around with this, um, but there, I guess there are a few things to, to consider. Uh, or parameters to set. One is called the, um, the, the viewing azimuth. So this is the direct direction of the observer to the surface. So this is just the direction you're pointing. You can change um, the, the viewing angle. So this is the, the, the viewing angle, how high you are. Are you looking down on the, on the Earth's surface or are you at a very shallow angle? Um, so viewing distance, how far we are away from the image. And then this is important, this is Z scale. So this is the vertical exaggeration factor. So actually, if we've got a very flat landscape, we can change that Z scale that exaggerates the peaks and troughs of the landscape. So again, we can lie with maps to, to show something that's exaggerate the peaks and troughs of the landscape more than, 
that, than is actually reality. But it can be useful for, for emphasizing different aspects of, a, of, of terrain. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so again, this is just really summarizing some, some of that. One thing you do, do need is, is, a, is a digital elevation model or a, what's, what's called a triangulated irregular network. We'll talk about that when we do terrain analysis next, next week. And, um, and then you know you have to think about this vertical exaggeration to whether you want to emphasize um, the, the, the heights of the of landscape or not. And I think this is, this is the Pinjara Hills site that we're, we're going to be going to um, tomorrow. Okay. okay, that's a pretty quick run through 3D visualization, but hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of how you can use it. And there's a bit more in the readings and you can, you'll have a, a bit of a uh, experience using that in the, in the prac. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, so, so the PRAC, as I said, it'll be focused on, on creating a map. That's really what you're going to focus on. Um, remember, there's a question at the end. There's a, there's a, bit, of, um, there's a, there's a bit of stuff at the end um, about, about 3D, 3D mapping and so on, so which you can have a go at. Um, so, so I'm going to leave it there, and I'll see you in the practical shortly. Okay, thanks. <laughs>